Pope Benedict XVI just came out with a uh, encyclical letter, this one on the uh, social life. And it's part of the uh, social teaching of the church going back to the end of the 19th century. There are many uh, interesting themes in it. The one that jumped out at me was his insistence on what he calls a logic of gratuity. He says, most of our economic and political life is dominated by two types of logic. One is the logic of exchange. I will give that I might get something back. Call it a sort of contractual logic. It dominates the marketplace. The second type of logic is more political, and it's a logic of obligation. So I'm obliged to give, let's say through taxation, in order that people might, um, there might be more justice in the society. So there's exchange, and then there's obligation. Nothing wrong with those two. In some ways, that's what uh, you know, greases the wheels of a, of a uh, modern society. However, the Pope says, beyond those two forms of logic, there should be a third, the logic of gratuity. I give not just to get something back. I give not because I'm obliged, but I give simply because it is good to give. Without that, he says, the other two will devolve into something cold and calculating and less than fully human. He reminds us, too, that God's way of dealing with the world is purely a logic of gratuity. God who makes the world out of nothing isn't obliged to create, nor does God get anything in return. Therefore, all of God's dealings with the world is purely under the rubric of a logic of gratuity. So we must learn how to imitate that distinctively divine logic. Think of this. Someone that follows very well a logic of um, exchange or of obligation could be described as a gentleman, someone that fulfills his obligations, you know, does what he's supposed to do. But the gentleman is not a saint. A saint is someone whose life is dominated by the logic of gratuity. You give simply because it's good to give. Okay, you say so far so abstract, but I think you can find some very interesting concrete examples of this principle. Go back to Europe, 1945. World War II has just ended. Europe lies in, in ruins, prompted by the terrible tyranny and deep injustice of, of Hitler and his, and his uh, colleagues. According to a logic of uh, exchange or obligation, what would you find? Well, Hitler and Germany ought to be punished. The same way many people after World War I said Germany ought to be strictly punished. We have the Versailles Treaty and so on. Well, Harry Truman and George Marshall, uh, the Secretary of State, decided no. Wouldn't it be better, according to a sort of logic of gratuity, to build up Germany, to build up Europe? And so we have the Marshall Plan. Now, I realize you can give a more cynical reading to it, but I agree with Churchill, who characterized the Marshall Plan as the most unsorted act in history. That's pretty good, and I think that's pretty right. This act of, of generosity, of, of generosity beyond the call of duty, beyond expectation. And what happened, in fact, in the wake of it, that Europe was rebuilt and peace was far more securely uh, guaranteed than it was after World War I, when simply a logic of, of uh, justice was pursued. Another example, I think the witness, again, of Martin Luther King. Um, blacks in this country had endured hundreds of years of slavery, of oppression, of segregation, of institutional violence, all of it. Deep, deep injustice. Many people, go back now to the mid-20th century, were calling for a, a retribution. You know, there should be an answering sort of violence, a demand injustice. Think of uh, Malcolm X or James Baldwin. But King, who fully acknowledged the deep injustice, there was no ambiguity at all in his mind about that, nevertheless called for a kind of logic of gratuity. He encouraged his people to respond in nonviolence so as to reach out to the white society which had oppressed blacks. Was it justice? I would say it was something more than justice. It was a logic of gratuitous love that went beyond justice and I would argue had a far more healing effect on society than a strict justice response would have had. I'll give you a third example. Go back to biblical times. You'll find this in the Old Testament, that every 50 years, a year of jubilee was declared. That meant a year in which all debts and all financial obligations were written off. 
it was a kind of a restoration of the whole society through a sheer gratuitous gift. Well, John Paul II, go back now about 10 years, decided to revive that idea. And he began to call many first world nations to declare a sort of jubilee in regard to third world nations. The Pope knew that so many developing countries were under such a weight of debt. Now, mind you, a debt, that means they had an obligation and justice to repay this debt. It was a question of justice, but the Pope said, perhaps a logic of gratuity that goes beyond mere justice would actually foster the development of these countries more. You know, what's intriguing there is that John Paul joined forces with Bono. That was one of Bono's great themes, it has been for the past 20 years, the, the relief of third world debt. There's a famous uh, um, photograph taken of uh, John Paul wearing Bono's glasses, and, and what it was was their meeting talking about just this problem. But I think that's a very good example of the logic of gratuity that goes beyond mere uh, justice. So I think in some ways Benedict's uh, idea here sums up the heart of Catholic social teaching, which is that justice must always be respected, of course. We must never fall below the standard of justice. That's always wrong. But justice needs to be leavened by something higher, which is this logic of love. And then our societies maybe will take on more of a saintly quality.